what I'm going to try to do today is to talk about four uh, challenges that I think um, face young women um, and what higher education can really do uh, to counter that. And I, I thought I would just begin um, by mentioning that when I finished my PhD here in 1982, I went off to Harvard to be an assistant professor. And at that time, um, there were only 13 tenured women in all of arts and sciences at Harvard. And there are many, many more now. I don't have that, that statistic at my fingertips. But this is all to say how much has changed in a relatively quick amount of time. And yet many of us are impatient for more change to be happening, which is why we're all gathered here today. So um, the first challenge I had planned to talk about was actually uh, discussed in the very first panel, but I'll, so I'll say a little bit. And uh, the challenge is really a societal one, that we, that we really internalize the stereotypes of our culture, all of us. I mean, women internalize stereotypes about women and men. And actually, some of the best work on this was done by Mazarin Banaji, who was once a colleague of Peter's at Yale and now is at Harvard. And what she has done really is, is focus on the kind of unconscious thinking and feeling that we do and how it unfolds in a social context, implicit stereotyping. So all of us, even the women in this room, have incorporated stereotypes about women that are not good, um, in for especially concerning um, achievement. So one of the things that Mazarin has shown is that when we're processing information, if we're process, if we, we hear a story about somebody who's a high achiever and then suddenly we're told it's a woman, it takes us longer to process it than if we're told it's a man. And I just can't resist telling you this story because it's a, a powerful example of it. Um, several years ago, I received a great honor. I was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And you get a little tag like this and it has a ribbon on it. And your partner gets a little tag with no ribbon on it. And when my husband and I you know, approached uh, the Sanders Theater to go in, you know, the, the person at the, who was letting us in wanted me to go upstairs with all of the spouses and wanted my husband to go downstairs. And I said, no, 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 see, I have, I have a ribbon. Yes, yes, yes. He said, you, you go upstairs and your husband goes <laughs> down there. And this is what I mean by, even given the information, it was very difficult for this person to process <laughs> that in this couple, I might have been in the one that had achieved something in this particular moment in time. So when you're confronted with an opposite association than what you expect, um, it shifts you. And that's a good thing, right? We, we want to see people who sort of break these stereotypes. They become um, an existence proof that something else is possible. And we know, for example, um, there are pretty good data on this, that women in single sex schools show weakened gender stereotypes. And um, that makes sense. And one of the reasons for it is unlikely the fact that when you're at these schools, women are in leadership roles, all of them, and there tend to be more women uh, professors there. So with respect to these stereotypes, um, the only thing you can really do is try to make the invisible visible. And the way you do, this was the point of consciousness raising in the 1970s. I love that term. Now we talk about reflection. And it's really the same thing. So at Smith, for example, um, and I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of interventions that I know about. Well, we have a center for work and life where there are a lot of reflection exercises. So we do have lean-in circles that the students organize themselves. We do um, bring in people that kind of break the mold um, uh, with respect to career choices. We have um, workshops on things like risk-taking and its rewards or your first five years out of Smith, or leadership for rebels. I mean, we do all these kinds of things. And then finally, we have this women's narrative project where women write their life narratives and try to reflect on um, what led to their successes. So they're, they're developing um, you know, some kind of mindset for it. Obviously, in career development centers in every higher education institution, we're doing some of the same thing. And I think what's most important is to really focus awareness on biases that might hold women back. Over lunch, several of us were talking about, uh, in some cases, it wasn't just biases. It was, um, I'm 59 years old, and it was person that, you know, I think I want to be a journalist. No, you can't be a journalist. I think I want to be an engineer. No, you can't be an engineer. I mean, I, I can point to uh, points of advice in my life where I was channeled um, away from careers that were more associated with men and that 
I'm a child psychologist. This is a career that I think women were channeled towards um, when I was in college. Okay, so I think there's lots we can do there about these implicit biases. Let, let me tell you a, a second one that I, I care a lot about. Um, the second challenge I want to talk about is that there really uh, still aren't enough role models, mentors, and supporters for young women, especially in the STEM fields. In fact, I, at lunch I sat with a woman who's in the PhD program in physics here, and um, she was demonstrating that for me. There are not enough full professors in, in physics uh, here, as in most places. The pipeline just isn't there. But even when I was at Yale in a field like child development, four of the five professors were male, even though this is a, fee, a, a, a field where there are a lot of, there's a lot of interest from females. So um, what do we do about that? Well, especially in the STEM fields, we need more of those existence proofs, right? So we need to expose women to successful women um, in their fields. And there certainly are successful women in physics. Um, probably a lot is hanging on their shoulders, just like a lot was hanging on the shoulders of Sandra Scar, who was the lone woman in psychology when, um, when I was studying here. But that's just the way that it is. That's what happens to pioneers, I think. Um, and I think that programs, uh, undergraduate programs um, at places like, I, I'm going to tell you about one at Duke and a couple at Smith, um, try, to make, try to make use of those existence proofs. So uh, in the case of uh, Duke, there's a program I like called the Baldwin Scholars. One of the reasons I like it is that it's also for low-income women. And they develop leadership, critical thinking, problem-solving skills. And so they bring in role models who look like them, and that includes people of color. And, and people like me, who are first-generation college students. So they want to be able to have these students meet with people that um, they can identify with. So there are academic seminars, cohort housing, internships. I'm going to say a lot more about internships, community service, um, and so on. We have a, a similar program called the, uh, it's, a, it's named after Phoebe Lewis, but it's a leadership program. Again, it's very skill-based. We're trying to teach the women um, negotiation tactics, conflict resolution, public speaking and presentation skills. And a lot of this is really designed around helping women develop a sense of confidence. Oftentimes, these stu I, I get to meet with them and they'll say to me, um, aren't you nervous when, you're, you know, when you give a large public lecture? And I say, I used to be. And I'm not anymore, right? I've, I've gotten over that, and you will too. So being able to talk to women like me, I know, makes an enormous difference for them. We have um, a summer praxis program that we're really proud of. Um, every Smith student can go on an internship one summer, usually after the junior year, and we will pay for it. Uh, this is important because um, that means low-income students can avail themselves of this opportunity, which is something I couldn't do but my daughter could. So my daughter interned with Ted Kennedy, which helped her get into law school, which helped her become a civil rights lawyer with the Massachusetts Attorney General's office. She can really trace that back. Mm -hmm. So we want to be able to do that um, for every student. And again, we're trying to um, have those uh, praxis experiences with, um, with women, with high-powered women, often Smith alumni, but not exclusively so. Um, even for older women, I thought I would tell you this story, too. When I was at Harvard, we did a lot of executive education. And um, I, w I led this program called um, Women in Leadership. And it was for women principals who were really aspiring to be superintendents and other kinds of leaders. It was the only program that we did w that was single sex. Um, and this might surprise you, too, but less than 20% of superintendents are women, even though you know, 95% of teachers or something like that are, are men. So here you have this female-dominated field, except at the highest level of leadership. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to do something about that. Um, and some of it was bringing in women superintendents, right? And it was helping these women create a network so that they could help each other once they left. It was talking about unique leadership challenges that women face. And I'm going to tell you about a, a, a very poignant one. Um, they were reading this article that, uh, from Harvard Business School that uh, Robin Ely had written, and um, it talked about how women are often referred to as bossy, which is a word mm -hmm. that is literally never applied to men. Uh, you may even know that there were some groups uh, trying to ban the word bossy last year. There was a social media campaign about it. 
And these women, when they started talking about it, got very, very teary. Uh, just, I think they had this collective realization of how they had been deliberately held back, or maybe it's unconsciously held back, but held back by these kinds of painful comments and realizing that everybody had been called that, including me, right? And one of the things I tell, you know, I have four younger siblings, and so I'm often called bossy perhaps because I'm a firstborn, but now I get to say, well, at, at Smith we call it leadership, right? <laughs> yeah. So, thank you. That's great. Yeah. So that's what we need to do for women. Um, third challenge, workplaces are optimized for men. There's a lot that I could say about that, but they really are. So we need to build a culture of women's leadership. That, that's why events like this are important. That's why um, organizations like the Women's Bar Association, the Society for Women's Engineers, are so important. Some places of work have um, organizations like this that sponsor events for women. Um, I just did one recently at a company in Boston called Sapient, and I did it on um, three myths about motherhood. There were fathers who came, but I, again, I think the, these kinds of events are really important. It's, maybe I'll have more time to talk about that during the discussion, but the final thing I want to mention, the final challenge, fourth challenge, is that it is true that women have more responsibility in the home for raising children, right? That's true. That was discussed briefly this morning. But um, there's a lot that we could do about this culturally and also individually and from a policy perspective. And every chance I've had since uh, Anne Marie Slaughter wrote Why Women Can't Have It All, I have said something critical and I'm not going to lose another opportunity. I really hated that article. And the reason I hated it is that it should have been called Why Parents Can't Have It All. If you actually read it, that's what it's about. And um, it's not good for women to be talking about um, balancing work and family in this way. It's true that if you look at the time use literature that women tend to have more responsibility for housework and for childcare, but though that has been changing over time. So we're seeing progress there. I don't think we're seeing that much progress with respect to women being primary caregivers of, caregivers of children and that's because the narrative in our culture is consistent and unyielding. It is just omnipresent that raising children is mother's work, not parents' work. And if there's anything you don't want to be called in our culture, if you're a woman, it is that you are a bad mother. So somehow, we need to do um, interventions at the individual level so that uh, couples can learn how to, um, how to share child-rearing responsibility more equitably. And of course, there's more that we could do as a culture around um, oh, parental leave and so on. One final anecdote, 1985, Yale University, I'm pregnant, can I have a maternity leave? No, because it wouldn't be fair to the male no. assistant professors because I might actually get more research done <laughs> during my maternity leave. <laughs> 1985, it's not that long ago, thank you. Thank you, Kelsey.